Welcome to the uh, next session of uh, Critical Care Reviews, where we're going to uh, again live stream across the world uh, the results of the vitamins trial. Um, we're honoured uh, to have the results, and we're also honoured to have Paul Marek here, and it was his work that uh, really generated the hypothesis that vitamin C might have a role that has led to an explosion of uh, research to um, help answer that question. So um, it's great that Paul uh, presented that work initially here um, a couple of years ago, and now we're starting to see the emergence of uh, trial results. Paul uh, suggested that um, uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis was one of the more boring um, uh, topics. Vitamin C, pretty much very similar. There's, there's never any controversy around uh, <laughs> vitamin C. But it is important um, in a, you know, a, a session like this where you know, you know, emotions can run high and people um, you know, have, have very strong opinions that you know, we keep to the science and we, we present um, and, and stay professional uh, throughout uh, the, the, the presentation. This is a, a hugely collegial meeting, and I think critical care is a hugely collegial specialty, and I think that's uh, important that we uh, maintain that. So, uh, without any further ado, a couple of other announcements just to remind people that the uh, hashtag is uh, CCR20, and the hashtag is the vitamins trial. So, uh, do feel free to uh, uh, comment on Twitter, and we'll uh, take questions from Twitter in due course as well. Uh, and with that, I will um, hand over to uh, Tomoko Fuji, who's going to give us the results for the first time of the vitamins trial. So, um, thank you, Rob, uh, for the invitation to this fantastic meeting. And uh, it's truly an honor to be here presenting the result of vitamins trial on behalf of the vitamins investigators. So the vitamins trial was supported by Alfred Research Trust, Austin Intensive Care Trust Fund, the Intensive Care Foundation, and the program to support institutional development of the universal system. For over 20 years, sepsis has been known to result in an acute deficiency of vitamin C. Uh, due to reduced intake and increased oxida oxidative consumption. And patients with septic shock have been shown to have significantly depleted vitamin C levels compared with non-septic patients. Humans have lost the ability to synthesize vitamin C in their human body uh, due to the mutation of the responsible gene. So we need to have sufficient amount of vitamin C exogenously to pre prevent the possible fatal deficiency. So previously in clinical research, uh, Professor Fowler from the United States conducted a phase one trial with um, 24 patients with severe sepsis uh, in the medical intensive care unit. And in the trial, patients were randomized into three groups to receive intravenous infusion of two doses of vitamin C or placebo. Infusion of vitamin C rapidly and significantly increased plasma vitamin C levels, and in this safety trial, no adverse events were reported. And patients receiving vitamin C uh, showed prompt reduction in SOFA scores, while placebo patients did not exhibit such reduction. In 2017, Professor Paul Merrick in the United States reported the single center before after study of the effectiveness of a so-called vitamin C cocktail for patients with, with severe sepsis. His team introduced a treatment protocol using a combination of vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine for patients with severe sepsis and compared patient outcomes before and after the implementation of the protocol. And they reported dramatic decrease in mortality and a rapid decline in vasopressor doses, suggesting a strong cardiovascular effect of the combination therapy. 
So vitamin C cocktail was the combination of 1.5 grams of intravenous vitamin C every six hours, uh, 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone every six hours, and 200 milligrams of thiamine every uh, 12 hours. This means patients were given six grams of vitamin C in a day, and an average size orange contains about 60 milligrams of vitamin C. So uh, six grams of vitamin C in a day is equal to 100 oranges per day. So there's a rationale behind the combination of vitamin C and hydrocortisone. In infection, the expression of vitamin C transporter is decreased and vitamin C cannot get into cells. And corticosteroid, corticosteroid receptor is oxidized uh, by inflammation, and, uh, but corticosteroid can increase the expression of vitamin C transporter, and in turn, vitamin C can help to reverse oxidized corticosteroid receptors. So thiamine. Thiamine is reportedly depleted in one-third of critically ill patients in the early phase of acute illness. And the thiamine deficiency can increase the conversion of glee oxalate to oxalate, and the extra oxalate can accumulate and can damage in kidneys, which is known as oxalate nephropathy. So supplementation with thiamine has been expected to reduce the further risk of AKI related to high-dose vitamin C therapy. Uh, several months later, Professor Bomaric's study was published. Two large randomized control trials were published, uh, on, which were on the effect of hydrocortisone uh, on steroids, uh, in the, of the effect of uh, steroids in septic shock were published, and the adrenal trial and aprox trial. The adrenal trial investigated the impact of stress dose hydrocortisone compared to placebo in patients with septic shock. And there was no significant difference in the primary mortality outcome, but intravenous hydrocortisone resulted in a reduced duration of shock and vasopressor use. Meta-analysis have consistently shown that corticosteroid therapy can shorten the time to resolution of septic shock. So this finding uh, implied the use of hydro hydrocortisone in the cocktail, vitamin C cocktail, might play a role in vasopressor dependency in septic shock. So based on these backgrounds, we designed the vitamins randomized controlled trial to investigate the effect of vitamin C therapy uh, on septic shock. So the vitamins trial was an international open-label randomized control trial which aimed to determine whether the combination of vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine compared with hydrocortisone alone improves the duration of time alive and free of vasopressor in patients with septic shock. Patients with a primary diagnosis of septic shock were screened for eligibility. Diagnostic criteria for septic shock based on the sepsis-3 criteria had to be fulfilled within a maximum of 24 hours prior to enrollment. Mm -hmm. Exclusion criteria. Exclusion criteria included age younger than 18 years, a do not resuscitate order, imminent death, Diagnosis of septic shock longer than 24 hours ago. Known or suspected disease with a strong indication or contraindication for any of the study drugs. And another indication for hydrocortisone than septic shock. Patients were randomly assigned to the intervention group or the control group. Patients in the intervention group received intravenous vitamin C, 1.5 gram every six hours hydrocortisone 50 milligrams every six hours, and thiamine 200 milligrams every 12 hours. Patients in the control group received intravenous hydrocortisone 50 milligrams every six hours. The treatment continued until the cessation of vasopressor administration or death 
or discharge from the ICU, but not exceeded 10 days. Cessation of vasopressor uh, was defined as discontinuation of all vasopressor drugs for four consecutive hours in the presence of mean arterial pressure larger than 65 millimeter mercury or target set by treating clinicians. So administration of intravenous vitamin C was not a usual practice in the countries where the trial was conducted. Then the administration of vitamin C was not allowed in the control group. However, thiamine administration was allowed in the control group at the discretion of treating clinicians. And this trial was an open label trial. So all the personnel were aware of the assigned treatment to each patient. The primary outcome was time alive and free of vasopressors at day seven. This was defined as a time that a patient was both alive and had not received vasopressors for at least four hours and censored at seven days. If a patient died while receiving vasopressor therapy following the initial episode of septic shock, the patient was assigned zero hours for this outcome. And if a patient was weaned from all vasopressors for four consecutive hours, then all, the, all of the remaining time through the day seven was treated as success, even if the patient died or had vasopressors restarted after weaning uh, within the seven day period. Secondary outcomes. Secondary outcomes were mortalities at 28 day, 90 day, ICU discharge and hospital discharge, and recruitment uh, requirement of artificial organ support, organ dysfunction, ICU free days, and hospital length of stay. Acute kidney injury, defined by KDU criteria, and vasopressor dose over 10 days were also pre-specified exploratory outcomes. A recurrence of vasopressor therapy after the initial cessation of vasopressor did not contribute to the primary outcome. So it contributed to this 28-day cumulative vasopressor free days and vasopressor dose over 10 days. With a view to informing the design of a subsequent larger trial powered to detect a mortality difference, a number of feasibility outcomes were also pre-specified. So sample size calculation. The difference of 25 hours was considered plausible as a clinically and minimally important difference for time alive and free of vasopressors. A sample size of 126 patients was initially calculated to provide 90% power with a standard deviation of 42 hours. However, in the absence of current and accurate data, the estimation of the standard deviation was updated from the uh, pooled standard deviation for the first 60 patients actually enrolled in the study, and the required sample size was recalculated. We used only pooled data for this recalculation, then adjustment of alpha level was not applied. After such adjustment and accounting for non-parametric distri distribution of the primary outcome and consent withdrawal, a sample size of 216 was estimated to detect a 25-hour difference based on an actual SD of 51.6 hours. The pr trial protocol and statistical analysis plan was published in June last year before the patient recruitment had been completed. And all analyses were conducted in accordance with the published statistical analysis plan. Uh, in briefly, a patient's data were analyzed according to their randomization group, excluding only those who withdrew consent. And we did not impute any missing data. So the first patient was enrolled on May 8th in 2018, and the last patient was enrolled on July 9th last year. The last day 90 follow-up was done on October 6th, and the result is now being presented today. So by 
the end of this presentation, the vitamins trial is published online in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We greatly appreciate the editorial team of the journal to meet this meeting schedule. During the 14 months of recruitment, 786 patients met the inclusion criteria and were screened to the eligibility. And 570 were excluded and 216 patients were randomized, which gave us a randomized to screened patient ratio of 1 to 3.6, suggesting minimal equipoise issues. The top ranked reasons for the exclusion were diagnosis of septic shock for more than 24 hours, imminent death, and prescription of hydrocortisone for another indication. Of the 216, nine, uh, 109 patients were randomized to the intervention group, 107 patients to the control group. Of these, five patients either withdrew or did not give consent to continue, and 107 patients in the intervention group and 104 patients in the control group were included in the analysis for the primary outcome. By day 90, two patients in each group withdrew consent for the follow-up or were lost to follow-up. The two groups were quite similar at baseline with respect of age, weight, and admission source to the ICU. And when we look at interventions provided to patients at randomization, 62% of the trial cohort was on mechanical ventilation, and all the patients were on vasopressor support at randomization as it was a part of inclusion criteria. And milrinone was given more likely to the intervention group. With regards to physiological and organ functions at randomization, Patients in the intervention group had lower Apache 3 score, had higher lactate and white blood cell counts, and in this trial, SOFA score ranged from 0 to 20, calculated by summing up cardiovascular, coagulation, liver, renal, and respiratory components. And the mean scores of 8.6 and 8.4 in the two groups indicated that the study population had moderate to severe organ dysfunction. Pulmonary sepsis was the predominant source of infection, followed by gastrointestinal sepsis in both groups. The time from ICU admission to randomization was around 12 hours and similar between the groups. And when we look at the study treatment in the two groups, at least one dose of the study drugs were administered to 99% of the intervention group and 98% of the control group. The mean duration of the study treatment was 3.4 days in both groups. With a view to obtaining a feasibility data of the intervention with multiple drugs, we collected time from the eligibility to the key drug in each group. Hydrocortisone was administered within nine hours and Vitamin C was administered within 12 hours after meeting the eligibility criteria of septic shock, showing that the pragmatic approach of this trial was well conducted at trial sites, and also that administ administration of vitamins on top of hydrocortisone in a timely manner was feasible. So primary outcome. In the control group, time alive and free of vasopressor after day seven was 124.6 hours. In the intervention group, it was 122.1 hours. The median of all pair differences was minus 0.6 hours, and there was no statistically significant difference. When we adjusted for site and baseline imbalance, which was navigated by p-value less than 0.2, again, there was no difference in the two groups. When considering a duration of vasopressors accounting for death, there was no significant difference between groups for the probability of becoming free from vasopressors 
with hazard ratio of 0 0.90. Secondary outcomes. There was no significant difference in all-cause mortality at 28 days or at day 90 after randomization. The number of patients who survived to discharge from the ICU or the hospital was similar between the groups. The Kaplan-Meier curves for the estimation of incidence of this showed again there was no statistical significant difference between the groups with a hazard ratio of 1.18. When we looked at artificial organ support, there was no difference between the groups with regards to 28-day cumulative vasopressor-free days, 28-day cumulative mechanical ventilation days, and 28-day renal replacement therapy-free days. So during the study, Vasopressor doses were collected every six hours, and the four doses per day, four doses per day, was summed uh, in each study day. And total vasopressor doses were calculated as the sum of noradrenaline dose and converted dose of uh, adrenaline and vasopressin. The vasopressor dose during the first ten days were not significantly different, with the ratio of geometric means 0.93. So when we looked at organ dysfunction, change in SOFA score at day three from baseline was significantly larger in the intervention group than in the control group. But I would point out here that SOFA score at day three was only obtained for patients who, who were staying at the ICU on day three. And the distribution of the maximum stage of AKI in the first seven days was not significantly different between the groups. 28-day IC-free days were similar between groups, and also there was no difference in the hospital length of stay. There were a total of three adverse events reported in three patients. Fluid overload and hyperglycemia in the intervention group and gastrointestinal bleeding in the control group. No serious adverse events or no suspected and expected serious adverse reactions were reported. In this trial, patients in the control group could receive intravenous thiamine if clinically indicated. And as a result, 7.7% .7 of the control group received thiamine, but the median dose was 300 milligrams per day, which was less than the dose in the intervention group, 400 milligrams per day and a uh, few patients with less dose of thiamine imply the minimum impact on the result. With regards to the protocol compliance, 20% and 11% in the intervention group received vitamin C or thiamine longer than defined in the protocol. And this was due to the logistics of applying the definition of shock resolution at bedside and these extended duration of the intervention might have increased separation between the groups and potentially overestimated the effect of the intervention. And these are the key findings from this trial. In the Mount Center International Open Label Randomized Clinical Trial of Patients with Septic Shock, the combination of intravenous vitamin C hydrocortisone and thiamine compared with hydrocortisone alone did not significantly affect time alive and free of vasopressor up to seven days. Mortality at any observation period and artificial organ support were not significantly different. Change in SOFA score was um, greater in the intervention group with statistical significance. However, there were 10 secondary outcomes without adjustment for type 1 error, and also the other outcomes filed to support the observed beneficial effect. Strengths of this study. Uh, this was a randomized trial with allocation concealment throughout the trial. We conducted sample size recalculation to have adequate power to detect a clinically meaningful effect and we targeted patients with early phase of septic shock to 
maximize the possible effects of the intervention, and we provided sufficient treatment period for the intervention to have any if it potential effect. We published the trial protocol and statistical analysis plan before completing the trial recruitment. And the trial was conducted at 10 sites, including both high and middle income countries. When we compare the trial with the previous study, the vitamins trial targeted on more severe patients with vasopressors, and here I'm showing the mean values of lactate levels for the direct comparison, the vitamins cohort had higher lactate levels. And also, vitamins patients had higher SOFA score, considering the vitamins trial did not include CNS component of the score. The intervention provided to the patients in the intervention group was identical between the two studies, but hydrocortisone was mandated to all the patients in the vitamins trial whereas 60% of the patients in the control group received hydrocortisone in the previous study. And the intervention period was longer in the vitamins trial than reported in the previous study. The decrease in mortality and the shortened duration of vasopressors observed in the previous study were not observed in this randomized controlled trial. Recently, Professor Fowler's team reported results of a phase two multicenter double-blind randomized control trial to assess the effect of the high-dose vitamin, ther vitamin C therapy in patients with septic ARDS, which was published in JAMA. And in the Citrus LI trial, 170 patients with septic ARDS were enrolled. And about 70% of the patients were vasopressor dependent and the SOFA score of the patients was slightly higher than in the vitamins trial. Intervention group in the citrus LI trial received 50 milligrams per kilo of intravenous vitamin C four times a day, and the average body weight in the vitamins trial was about 80 kilograms, so the dose of vitamin C was about 2.5 times higher in the citrus LI than in the vitamins trial. Plasma vitamins levels at baseline were similar between the two trials, showing hypovitaminosis at randomization. And the primary outcomes in the citrus LI trial were SOFA score and two biomarkers, uh, which were CRP and thrombomodulin, and both of which did not show statistically significant difference between the two groups. However, uh, decrease in 28-day mortality was observed in the citrus LI, LI trial which was not observed in the vitamins trial. The major difference between the citrus LI trial and the vitamins trial would be the dose of vitamin C. And in the nested cohort study of the vitamins trial, medium plasma concentration of vitamin C increased to 369 micromolar one hour after the first dose and achieved supraphysiological plasma level at six hours. As there is limited knowledge regarding optimal target plasma concentrations of vitamin C to achieve clinically and significantly uh, significant outcomes, and there was no consistent benefit on improving organ dysfunctions or mortality across these randomized controlled trials, uncertainty remains about how the different dosing might modify the result. So we acknowledge several limitations of the vitamins trial. First, the trial was open label in design and lacked blinded outcome assessment due to the logistic complexity of blinding two interventions at multiple sites in three countries. However, the patients were taken care for by more than 100 attending physicians in three countries, making systematic performance bias very unlikely. Second, uh, the individual effects of vitamin C and thiamine were not assessed separately. We put research priority to examining the beneficial effect of the vitamins and hydrocortisone combination over examining that of each vitamin because previous studies have suggested both vitamin C and thiamine might be beneficial for patients 
in septic shock and an observational study uh, reported decreased mortality associated with the combination therapy. Third, uh, the thiamine levels were not measured in this trial, making it uncertain whether randomized patients did or did not have thiamine hypovitaminosis and whether such hypovitaminosis were corrected. Time to the administration of antibi antibiotics was not collected. However, all patients had already received antibiotics at enrollment. As this was a concealed allocation, randomized controlled trial, and treatment allocation occurred after antibiotics had been given, uh, the randomization would have achieved balance. This trial was underpowered to detect any difference in secondary outcomes, then any findings in the secondary outcomes should be taken as exploratory. And, oops, sorry. and we collected adverse events only when treating clinicians adjudicated, so uh, other uh, possible adverse events were not collected. In conclusion, in patients with septic shock, treatment with intravenous vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine compared with intravenous hydrocortisone alone did not significantly improve the duration of time alive and free of vasopress administration over seven days. This suggests that treatment with intravenous vitamin C, hydrocortisone, and thiamine does not lead to a more rapid resolution of septic shock compared with intravenous hydrocortisone alone. So these were the sites which took part in the trial. We would like to acknowledge all the patients and the families and clinical bedside staff, site investigators and research coordinators at these sites. And this is the management committee, including both experienced and new investigators in the critical care field. And the trial was co coordinated at NCRC in Monash University. And we would also thank the JAMA editorial team again for the rapid review and creating this beautiful infographics. Thank you all. Smogo, thank you very much for that uh, very thoughtful and balanced presentation. So um, I'm going to ask now uh, Paul uh, over the next 15 minutes to uh, give us the uh, editorial. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> so my wife just texted me that I should extend our sympathy to the Australians and all the Australian animals that have died with these terrible fires. Okay, could I have my slides, please? Oh, this is a clicker. So firstly, my disclosures, and this is important, I have none. I don't own the patent on vitamin C. I never invented vitamin C. I don't make vitamin C. I have no interest anyway in vitamin C. I also need to tell you I was invited many months ago to give this editorial response. Despite numerous attempts, I was unable to get the paper. I did not see the paper before I left the USA. I received the paper two days ago without the appendix, supplements, or the commentary. So that put me up at a significant disadvantage. I had planned previously two PowerPoints, depending on the outcome. But since I saw the paper and the Titanic disaster, my PowerPoints were no longer valid. So I had to, at the last minute, redo my PowerPoints. This put me at a severe disadvantage, for which I am really annoyed. So the other thing is, sepsis is a really complicated disease. You can't look at any intervention in isolation. This is really important. So we have just published a series of papers on sepsis. This is available in general thoracic disease. All these papers are available now as an EPUB. The journal will be published next month. I need to highlight 
a number of really important topics. The first one is fluid resuscitation in sepsis, the great 30 milligrams per kilogram hoax. So we know, without question of doubt, that excess fluid kills patients with sepsis. We have Dr. Maitland here who did the landmark FEAST trial, which clearly demonstrated this. And this has been demonstrated in multiple, multiple studies. There's not a single study that shows that under-resuscitation is harmful. We then need to talk about the origin of the lactobolo reflex. This is the mythology of giving fluids to treat patients with an increased lactate. It's based in some kind of Greek mythology. And lastly, Dr. Gerbys, who's sitting over there, wrote an outstanding paper on the role of randomized controlled trials in diseases as complicated as sepsis. So actually, I was here three years ago, and I presented our before-after study as before it had actually been published. And it's important to actually to go through the conclusions, because as it so happens, it's remarkably important how these conclusions actually are. So I said, our results suggest the early use of intravenous vitamin C to give them steroids and thiamine are effective in preventing organ dysfunction, including acute kidney injury, and reducing the mortality of patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. Please note the word early. I then said, additional studies are required to confirm these preliminary findings. Interesting, I never said randomized controlled trials. I said additional studies. So what's the philosophy behind HAT? So it targets the host's immune response to infection, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. We use multiple agents with overlapping and synergistic biological properties. Most importantly, it's safe. To date, we are unaware of a single side effect. Let me say that again a single side effect with this combination. Let me say that again. We are unaware of a single side effect. In our patients, we closely monitor oxalate levels and have not had a single patient with hyperoxalosis. And the most important point, this is cheap and readily available. And this is important because we heard yesterday, and we'll come back to this, 11 million people 11 million people die of sepsis every year. Most of them are in third world countries or resource poor countries who cannot afford expensive drugs. Very important. And because of this, a lot of people just do not like me and this protocol. So the criticisms, and there have been hundreds, relentless, relentless. So we never heard this was a small retrospective study with non-concurrent controls, lack of blinding with single center. We never heard that. However, these are some of the responses from some of the world leaders in critical care. The results are totally implausible. This is snake oil medicine. This is no better than homeopathy. Vitamin C is not safe. It causes kidney injury. A highly invested investigator who's made false and preposterous claims. These are made by senior people in the leadership of societies that we belong to. The most interesting one was this is a local effect, it only happens in Norfolk. So you may not know that Norfolk is the biggest naval base in the world. We have seven aircraft carriers, no one knows. So that People in Norfolk have scurvy. They're full of sailors. They all got scurvy. That's why it works. This was said with all seriousness. However, what people may not know is there are at least 400 peer-reviewed experimental, preclinical, and clinical publications evaluating vitamin C in sepsis. This didn't just come out of space. These are highly reputable journals and highly reputable scientific studies. 
probably more than most other investigations in critical care. Most people want to be blind to this data. And the evidence is summarized in numerous review papers. So I'll tell you about our experience, because I'm a clinician. I'm not a trialist. I'm a clinician. I look after patients at the bedside. I've been doing this for 30 years. So we first patient was January 2016. We're now January 2020. We have treated over 1,500 septic patients admitted to our ICU. Importantly, most of these are medical patients. The any surgeons, yes, surgical sepsis is a different animal. Mixing surgical patients with medical patients is a disaster. I need to add, there are no exclusion criteria. If you are septic and you come to our ICU, it doesn't matter if you have HIV, sickle cell disease, kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, malignancy, you get treated. We've treated over 1,500 patients, and I can tell you that clinical response is reproducible. Reproducible clinical effect. Our nurses see it. Our residents see it. Our patients see it. It's very uncommon for a patient to die. The dying of sepsis, there's usually some underlying condition that we can't get source control or some other extraneating circumstance. And again, no side effects. Because of my paper, I've been consulted on over 1,000 patients worldwide. I get calls or emails, at least two or three, every single day. Every single day. This has given me unique perspective into the management of sepsis across this planet. In addition, there are hundreds of physicians, let me say this again, hundreds of physicians across this globe who have seen the same reproducible effect that we have seen. And I introduce one of them, Irvin, where are you? Please stand up <laughs> and stay standing. This is what he sent me. I never told him to do this. After introducing HAT therapy to the equation, sepsis is no longer a concern of mine. If they are not already dead at arrival, these patients survive. And they survive with their health intact. This is real world medicine. Thanks, Irvind. Can I introduce you to Pierre? Where are you, Pierre? This is Pierre from Wisconsin, who has exactly the same experience. And indeed, we will see his data just a little bit long later. What I should also add is a paper was published in the Blue Journal. Most people consider the Blue Journal a highly respected journal, undergoes highly scientific review, which showed in pediatric patients, HAT therapy reduces the risk of death. We know how important sepsis is in the pediatric population. This is just out in the Blue Journal. So what have I learned? And I've learned a lot. Timing matters. Dosing matters. Volume matters. We monitor procalcitonin. It is a most intriguing biomarker. I'm not going to talk about it. I don't have time. And then the quality of supportive care matters. You've got to have doctors who actually understand clinical medicine and can provide care at the bedside. So what about dose? We talked about the IV dose. So it's interesting. If you give it Q8 or Q12, the response is attenuated. If you give it as a continuous infusion, the, the response is attenuated. If you emit thiamine or corticosteroids, the effect is attenuated. So there are studies that are designed to fail. Let me say that again. People will design studies to fail. So this was a study in which they gave vitamin C in the emergency department for one day. For one day, and they used the wrong dosing strategy. And I can guarantee you, in fact, I'll take a bet, the editorial that company's vitamins will quote this study and all the other 
bogus studies. This is a bogus study, and I contend that doing a study designed to fail is ethically and morally unacceptable. So, what have I learned? Timing matters. Early therapy. We know about door-to-needle time. Septic shock is no different from an AMI or a stroke. It's exactly the same. We know door-to-needle time is absolutely essential. For this therapy, you want a door-to-needle time of less than six hours. Septic shock is a highly time-dependent disease. And what we do, we give the first dose in the emergency department at the same time we give antibiotics. And it's really cool to know, oh, I'll come back to that. So this is data from Pierre. So Pierre has extensive experience. He looked at observed versus predicted mortality as a function of time. Very important. And you can see, if you give it less than six hours, patients do not die. And then with increasing delay in therapy, the response gets attenuated. Once you're after 18 hours, you're done. What's so cool, so people who think this is homeopathy, this is a really cool study in a reputable medical journal which shows vitamin C acts synergistically with antibiotics to kill bacteria. It's a very cool study. Antibiotics work with vitamin C to increase microbial killing. What it does at the same time is it downregulates the pro-inflammatory response and limits oxidative injury. This is how it works, and this is why you have to give it early at the time you give antibiotics. So, what about timing and vitamins? It's actually a difficult question to answer because the data is hidden. So what do we know? This is in the paper. Time from admission to randomization. Time from admission to the ICU to randomization, 13.7 hours. Okay, you can see where we're going with this. This is truly the most astonishing data. This is not from me. This is from the vitamins group. As you know, they did a pharmacokinetic study in patients who got vitamin C. As a pharmacologist, I know timing is really important to work out your pharmacokinetics. Let me read what it says. They saying this, not me. Time from randomization to first dose of vitamin C in hours, 14.9 hours. 14.9 hours. The mean, median. So that means 50% of patients receive vitamin C 15 hours after being randomized. And I ask you, what were they doing for 15 hours? You can get a bag of oranges. You can squeeze the oranges. You can extract the orange juice. You can extract the vitamin C and give it within 14 hours. And this was a non-blinded study. There was no blinding. How is this possible? So, they do not tell us the door to ICU time. Absolutely critical. Presentation to ICU admission is not presented. We know, looking at the data, only half came from the ER. Other patients came from the operating room. They came from other hospitals. They came from other countries. They come from other solar systems. How long did it take for patients to get from presentation door to ICU? We have no idea. We know time from ICU admission to randomization was 13.7 hours. Time from randomization to first dose, 14.9 hours. Therapy was initiated a minimum of 28.6 hours after presenting to hospital with sepsis. Greater than 32 hours needle to door time. Is there anybody in the audience who would think that giving an intervention 32 hours after admission to hospital, this may be an antibiotic or other therapy, is acceptable? 
If there's anyone in this audience who think this time delay is acceptable, could you please stand? Okay, Your Honor. I see the jury is unanimous. The jury of your peers is unanimous, waiting 32 hours to give a first dose is not acceptable. But why don't we look at the other studies presented yesterday? The 65, the TRAC, the COAC, the SPICE, the ROCKS. All of these patients' time from disease onset to intervention was less than six hours. Here we have 32 hours. This was a study designed to fail. The other thing that's important is volume matters. Excess fluid dilutes the clinical benefit. As we know from FEAST, fluids cause hemodynamic collapse. They increase organ failure. They delay organ recovery. We know that if you look at the kinetics of sofa change, it's absolutely dependent on your fluid balance. So then there's an interaction between volume overload and timing of therapy. This is really bad. Lots of fluid, late therapy. This is bad. Lots of fluid, less late. This is even less bad. A little bit of less fluid, earlier vitamin C. This is the best. A little bit of fluid, early vitamin C. So what about fluids and vitamins? Astonishingly, the word fluid in a patient's in septic shock the word fluid does not appear in the manuscript. Please read it. It does not appear. This is a study on patients in septic shock, and we do not know how much fluid they got. We don't even know their fluid strategy. It's not provided. 65 told us about fluid. The only thing they mention in their protocol is if the lactate is greater than two despite fluid resuscitation, which means to me, these are believers in the lactobolo reflex. That's all they talk about. So vitamins has a fatal flaw. Do we need more flawed randomized controlled trials? I need two more minutes. Jean-Louis recently wrote this paper about the failure of randomized controlled trials in critical care. He then said, we should abandon randomized controlled trials in intensive care unit because of the following reasons. And all the ones in red apply to vitamins. So not only do we do a bad study, but we're now going to do a meta-analysis where we pool all these bad studies in our pot, mix them up, and come out with some more nonsense. So I need to finish. So when I first presented, I spoke about the cure for sepsis. I realized that was simplistic, that you need steps to the cure. And this is important because we heard yesterday 11 million people die of sepsis every year. And I'm absolutely convinced on my kid's life that if we institute these steps, we can reduce the mortality by at least 50 percent. We're talking about 600, sorry, 6 million lives. The vitamin C protocol is part of that. Early diagnosis, correct antibiotics, source control, conservative fluid, early norepinephrine, and state-of-the-art evidence-based care. So this is the changing algorithm. The old approach, the new approach. And if you give me the license, I'm going to ask Dr. Even. So just for the sake of time, I will bring him into the conversation, absolutely, but for the sake of time, we'll sort of get you to finish your editorial, and then we'll okay. uh, move so on. So what I would like to do is these gentlemen, what we saw, that clinical study is devoid of reality. I'm sorry, it's got nothing to do with real-life medicine. These are people who treat patients. They can tell for themselves. So you may not believe me, but listen to them. And my last point is, if you don't believe me, anybody in this audience, 
is welcome to visit me in my ICU when I round with patients and actually see that what we're talking is not BS. This is the damn truth. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you for uh, that um, editorial. Um, so uh, I'm now going to ask Tomoko um, if she'd like to reply to any of the comments raised. <laughs> very much for the great comment. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, I would like to uh, clarify the time from uh, randomization to the first dose and the time from meeting the eligibility criteria to the first drug. So as, as I presented, uh, in this trial, hydrocortisone was administered within nine hours from meeting the eligibility criteria of septic shock to the, uh, from the meeting the eligibility criteria of septic shock and to the first dose. And vitamin C was administered within 12 hours after meeting the eligibility criteria of septic shock. And so um, on behalf of the sub-study uh, Professor Paul Merrick referred to, um, I would like to take this opportunity to correct the numbers reported in the previous uh, nested cohort study in the paper. But I, as I presented, in the vitamins trial, patients in the intervention group received vitamin C within 12 hours mm -hmm. from meeting eligibility criteria uh, to the first dose. Yes, and uh, we also agree that fluid information is uh, very important in treating patients with septic shock. Um, but it was not specified, so we did not report the fully fluid balance at this moment, but we collected the data. So I think the management committee would be happy to report the fluid balance data uh, after we go back to down. Down under. Yes. Thank you very much, Tomoko. That's Thank fantastic. You. So I guess there might be a few questions. Um, what I would say is that we don't want monologues. So we do want questions, and I'm going to bring in the, the additional experts that um, Paul has, has uh, suggested. Um, but what I might do is uh, uh, go to Matt, who's our uh, Twitter moderator, to sort of uh, see if there's anything happening on Twitter. <laughs> yes, so, so a lot of the guys that are following live stream have never had so much fun watching a live stream as they've just had now. A um, couple of questions have come in. So if, if we were to await further trials to perhaps support Dr. Marek's theory about this combination therapy, what do we do in the meantime? Do we use the TRIO as a just-in-case measure, as a measure of last resort, um, given that we haven't shown it has any survival benefit? So can so, I respond to that? So I'll get, I'll get both. I'm going to ask Tomoko, and then I'm going to ask Paul, but maybe Tomoko first. OK. Yeah, yeah. One come. So um, maybe, as we usually do, um, we, will, we will wait for the results uh, for many ongoing trials examining the effect of combination therapy. And also, there are many trials that are ongoing to examine the effect of more high-dose vitamin C. Uh, therapy, so I think we should wait until seeing the, those And Paul, results. you can sit there as well. The, My the, the, question the... is to you. If your daughter was in the ICU dying of septic shock, would you deny her a therapy that we know, we know absolutely for a fact is safe and that may potentially save her life? That's the question you need to ask. There are no downsides. There are absolutely no downside. The only downside is you may save the patient's life. To deny it, I think, is in, in, unacceptable. And then that's just the way it is. The problem with the ongoing trials, and I have severe reservations about these trials. I was never consulted on any of them because it, I was told I would telepathically, let me say that, telepathically alter the outcome of the study. So I was never consulted on any of these studies. And I am fearful that the problems with this study are going to be replicated. If you're going to do a randomized study, you better be sure it's well designed and it replicates world 
real life world experience. So when it's your daughter dying in the ICU, think about it. So I'm going to take uh, a couple of the suggested uh, people who have used it. Um, so I'll come to um, yourself and then um, the other. Yes. So yeah, I, I just want to make a quick comment. So uh, Dr. Merrick referred to uh, my work, which is about to be published next month. Um, and just on this timing issue, so uh, I think it's important because you clarified time from eligibility, which means that you met all the criteria, which even required a few hours of pressers, if I recall. I think I heard that. Um, you know, what we found in our data, because Paul referred to it, is that we saw no benefit after about 12 hours from presentation. So all of the benefit was early administration, and we measured it from ED triage time. So as soon as that patient came with some complaint that led to septic shock, that's where our clock started. And when I designed my trial, it, it never even occurred to me to include someone who would be as much as 24 hours. Because those are medians that you're presenting. So again, I, I don't want to hop on the bandwagon here, but the timing is, is just, um, I'm a little confused, and so Dr. Marek presented that table showing all these other trials, and I want to commend this meeting. This is a great meeting, listening to trialists and hearing the conduct of clinical trials and the challenges and some of the nuances, and some of the achievements. I mean, those trials that were pre presented yesterday, when you see how quickly they got to the intervention, it's remarkable. In Africa, African children, hundreds of patients, they're all treated within six hours. Can maybe the trialists speak as to why this trial diverged from all the other trials. This is critical care, right? So critical illness, multi-organ dysfunction, that's the pathway to death. The delays seem a little bit odd in the design. And so I just want to say, because our, our data that's going to be presented really shows that the time thing is, is just a major variable. I mean, after 12 hours from presentation, we just, we don't see it altering outcomes. So take a couple this, of other... this didn't add anything to what I already know. Okay, I'm going to take a couple of other comments and then I'm going to give Tomoko the opportunity. So um, if you want to make a comment? Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Paul, for your clarifying uh, editorial. Uh, I must also express that uh, I'm always worried about these patients, and that a large effort must be done uh, early on from the presentation to the diagnostic part. Uh, and then uh, I'm sorry to see that this study does not address the emergency of this lethal condition. Uh, not detecting an, a, a, a difference does not, does not automatically mean that it, there is no difference. It depends on the study design. Uh, uh, this uh, study does no, nowhere near mimic the real world, su real world suggested use of these me medications. So that is uh, early, where it works, rather than late. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And again, just to re-emphasize, we want questions, not monologues, but I'm going to give a chance for another question, and then we're going to get to Mogo to respond if we get a... Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Matt Erickson, Veterans Affairs uh, Medical Center. And question, uh, I'm just gonna make a quick comment and uh, to help people, you know, to help some understand what the issue, one of the main issues with fluids. Uh, when you're giving the hat components, think of Fick's law of diffusion, uh, D is equal to, is proportional to minus DC DX, okay, concentration, distance, and so forth. So. Maybe I have a DC DX like this. Maybe I have a DC DX like this, okay? And you dump four to six liters of salt water into somebody, and now it's like so, and transport will be impaired. Of course, there are other problems with large, uh, aggressive crystalloid as well. But uh, that's just a comment I wanted to make. Thank you all. Great meeting. Thank you. So I'm going to go to questions, uh, but I'm going to give Tomoko an opportunity if you want to reply to any of the comments. Um, yes, yeah, so about the timing, uh, not all the patients in the vitamins, tr uh, vitamins trial came from emergency department, so we could not collect door to randomization time uh, because due to the def definition of the study population, we included all the patients <coughs> who came into the study ICU. Whatever, wherever those patients were before the ICU came to ICU. And, but uh, I agree that the timing will be uh, investigating in a future trial, uh, future studies. And um, about the uh, pharmacokinetics, and there's uh, not so many studies examining the uh, pharmacokinetics of vitamin C in these populations. So I think our data are just a start point to um, 
look into the effect of the dose and the concentration and the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in those patients. Thank you. Thank you, Tomoko. So I'm going to take maybe three or four more questions uh, and then we're going to go to the panel. Um, on you go. Uh, Stefan Schaller from Berlin. Um, can you explain to me, you uh, had the idea of treating for 10 days, but I saw, when I, when I remember correctly, the treating period was in the median three days. So can you explain a little bit more about the patients? How long were they ventilated? How long did they stay on the ICU so that they can understand the cohort a little bit better? Um, so uh, our study intervention continued up to 10 days, but um, when patients discharged from the ICU, then the intervention stopped. And um, sorry, I don't have uh, the duration of mechanical ventilation or vice versa, uh, mechanical ventilation uh, currently with, with me, but um, the median duration of intervention uh, was uh, more than 3.4, uh, was about 3.4 days, and uh, those patients uh, received uh, the intervention uh, until the shock resolution of the initial septic shock. And uh, the median time of the ICU uh, length of stay was around three or four days. Uh, I don't have the exact number right now, but yes, that's that we observed. Okay, thank you. Morten? Yeah, Morten, Copenhagen, Denmark. First of all, thank you very much for a great trial, and thank you to both of you for, for nice presentations. I would like to ask about something about safety. So since only very few patients have indeed been randomized to this treatment, I think it's really difficult to talk about safety because you would lead, need much larger numbers. And certainly the individual elements, so hydrocortisone, thiamine, and vitamin C, they do have side effects, in my opinion. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this. So to Moko and then Paul. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, we can talk about hydrocortisone, so we... <laughs> who is, who is I that? I was gonna go to Moko and then you, okay. uh, just as a presenter and then. So uh, vitamin trial was only 262 patients. Uh, well, I don't want to say only, but it's 200 patients. And in those 260 patients, we did not observe any serious adverse events. Um, and we did not separate the uh, effect of any side effects of vitamin C and thiamine from uh, hydrocortisone. So, um, yes, I agree that we need more, uh, more data and we need to collect um, the data from many more studies, not only from randomized controlled trials, uh, especially for adverse events, I suppose. Thanks. Paul? That's a really good question. So we can break it down. Hydrocortisone. So this was looked at very carefully in the adrenal and the French study. And what they found, there are no side effects. The only side effect is some hyperglycemia, and who cares? Who cares about hyperglycemia? There were no other adverse events, no infections, no GI bleeds, no wound dehiscence, no complications. And the idea that four days of hydrocortisone at physiological stress doses is going to cause side effects is preposterous. In terms of vitamin C, thousands of patients have received intravenous vitamin C. The only caution is in patients with malignancy who get 150 grams, okay? 100 times the dose we give, 100 times. There is some data of hyperoxalosis in kidney stones. There are isolated cases in patients receiving 150 grams. In the doses we use, I am unaware of a single report of a single side effect. And if you look at the physiology, this is a profoundly safe molecule. And you know what, Dr. Fowler has lots of experience. You know, maybe he can answer the well, question. We're going to bring in the panel, uh, and uh, we're going to ask Kathy to ask a nice brief and uh, uh, question, then we'll get an answer, and then we'll open up the panel. Tomoko, um, congratulations. It's hard to do trials. And uh, one of the things that when we do trials is we learn how if we were going to do a trial in the area again, we, we learn important aspects. And we wouldn't be having this discussion without your trial. So um, congratulations for that. Um, just a couple of issues. One is this issue of timing, which is obviously being, I'd like to say, discussed, but maybe discussed isn't the right word. Um, it's been discussed. Um, 
I wonder whether, with all the data that we've got today, the randomized data, so not just your trial, I understand there are, there are a few other uh, bits of randomized data, and perhaps some analyses in some of the less robust observational data, whether we could actually explore this notion of timing already and, and, uh, and the importance of timing. I, I don't feel that I've seen a, a robust analysis on that, and that would, that would be sort of fascinating and, and, and help inform the next trial. My question to you is really one of uh, your primary outcome. Because um, uh, it would seem to me that a patient-centered outcome isn't uh, four hours free of vasopressors in seven days, blah, 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 whatever it was, sort of type thing. And, and why that was chosen, was it about trying to get some early evidence out on vitamin C? Or, or was there uh, some uh, other sort of uh, something else behind that? Well, thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the definition of the primary outcome. Um, this trial was designed to, uh, with a view to informing the, a future larger subsequent trial aiming for detecting a more patient-centered outcomes like mortality. So we tried to um, confirm the observed effect in the previous study and uh, we tried to do it in a more direct way to detect the effect. So that's why we define the primary outcome as such. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, I know there are lots of other questions, and I'm going to try and squeeze some in at the end, but I want to open it up now to the panel. So uh, we've got four very experienced panelists in, in, in different ways. So what I might do is just get everyone to say uh, very briefly introduction name and, and who they are, and, and they're linked to uh, the, the trial and why. I'm Andrew Althaus. I'm a clinical trial statistician from the University of Pittsburgh, and I have no link to the trial other than the comments I'm about to make. <laughs> Fantastic. Kath? Kath Maitland. I'm based in Kenya, where all the sepsis is. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did the FEAST trial, and I would actually like to reflect, my reflections will be around how I, um, the perception of the FEAST trial in certain areas. Fantastic. Paul? Uh, so I'm Paul Young. I'm one of the investigators on the vitamin trial, vitamins trial. And um, look, uh, I have to say I've always found the physiological story rather compelling. And the thing that drove me to be involved in this trial was a belief that uh, it's important to test hypotheses in randomised trials. Barry? I'm Barry Fowler. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, about 60 miles away from Paul Merrick um, and have been involved in uh, studying vitamin C research for over 12 years now, both in preclinical models, which I will mention uh, a little bit, and then the Citrus ALI trial. Okay, so I'm going to go to Kath first because I think you know this is very emotive, and you know Feast was also very emotive. So it would be interesting to hear um, your your views on uh, the vitamin Z story in your context of, of Feast. Um, so, I'm, so to get funding to do a, the, the clinical trial like Feast took years, and you'll hear a little bit about this last year. But obviously, there was a very mixed review when it was published, and I think. Possibly this audience have, have a lot more positive opinion. But op opinion makers in my field um, call it, called it a seriously flawed trial and uh, for, for many different reasons. And that, so we are stuck behind a, a system of um, evidence which it goes from expert opinion, which is really largely fluid boluses for many recommendations are still expert opinion. We took that up to almost the highest quality multi-center trial, and, P and the WHO still rejected that. So I, that's one of the reflections. I, we have to do clinical trials to know which therapies work and whether there may have been some design flaws that, um, or uh, ways that it could be adapted. I think we have to be very, very careful um, at, at saying that this was a flawed trial. Thank you. Now that's very wise words. Um, so uh, on that, we're going to move, I think, over to the, the, the methodological comments. And you know, no trial is perfect. I'd, I'd love to do a perfect trial. I don't think I ever will. But you know, so uh, you know, it, it's it's not meant as criticism. So uh, your thoughts would be great. 
So, uh, I mean, I think one really important thing to, to keep in mind about uh, this trial is that it's, it's really analogous to sort of a, a phase two trial or a pilot trial, you know, with respect to the comment about a, a patient-centered outcome. You know, a trial of this size, it, it's very difficult to, to be able to show a benefit on a patient-centered outcome. So what really this is about is sort of a, an effort to, to get something about preliminary efficacy as well as uh, refining processes and seeing what we can learn in the actual execution of the trial. Because you're gonna, before you do a trial on 5,000 patients, do it on 100 patients and see what you learn. And I'm involved actually in a lot of trials that are, are somewhat analogous to this, you know, 50 or 100 patients, where really the, the goals are about uh, feasibility, uh, recruitment rates, and understanding things about processes. So the, the timing issue, which is obviously, uh, you know, drawn quite a bit of discussion here, I think, it, you know, one of the things that you definitely learn from this trial, if that's postulated as potentially a reason for the, the lack of, of early uh, treatment effect on the preliminary outcomes, I think then the trialists and the team can sort of reflect internally on why that occurred, if they have any ability, whether that through, be through sort of qualitative discussion with the clinicians who are actually delivering the care, uh, or actually, you know, data on the processes that they have, because I think that's potentially one of the most valuable things to come out of a trial of this size, because this size trial, it's not enough, even if the care had been delivered perfectly, it's not enough to show, uh, it's not large enough to show an effect on mortality unless the effect on mortality is astronomical. So really here, I, I think the key is rather than reflecting on sort of the observed lack of, of benefit on, on the, these outcomes, is to look at the processes, look at what happened in the trial, uh, you know, if the trialists, I don't know how readily that's able to be shared, but to understand what maybe were the impediments to delivering the care, um, you know, expeditiously. Uh, the other comment that I'll make is, is that as we, we move forward, if, uh, and this will not, fortunately, not be my decision to have to make, uh, you know, if, if you look at this and you say that, that a further trial is warranted, uh, because you don't believe that the data presented to date are, are compelling enough to warrant widespread adoption of this therapy, but we can take the lessons that we've learned and, and test all of those uh, sort of process improvements in a large-scale trial. Some other things to keep in mind, I think, um, are the potential to use maybe a multifactorial design. If there's, there were some questions maybe about whether individual components of the intervention, is it actually just the addition of vitamin C, uh, or is it the whole synergistic combination? So you might be able to consider a factorial design to test the individual components. And uh, if there's concern about heterogeneity of, of sepsis and the thought that maybe this, maybe this only works for certain types of patients, um, the possibility exists to consider an adaptive enrichment design in future trials when maybe you try to identify those subgroups through the trial itself and then you're able to identify uh, maybe the type of patient or the, the phenotype where this therapy perhaps has a bigger benefit or maybe patients where it's, uh, where it's futile. So there we go. Andrew, that, that's fantastic. I mean, I think the phase two nature of the trial is really important. And Paul, I know you've written in this in the past. And you know, one of the things, along with many other things, um, one of the things that I struggle with is actually there's no good surrogate outcome, as, as Kathy sort of intimated. Um, you know, so should we even be reporting efficacy outcomes in phase two and maybe just use them, you know, the confidence intervals and maybe use them as a way to par a, a subsequent study. So Paul, as a trialist, I'd like you to comment. Well, I mean, I, I think in this trial, the, the biological effect that was postulated was that this would lead to res resolution of shock. Um, and, and we actually have power to detect a clinically important difference in resolution of shock and there was no suggestion whatsoever of an effect. Now, you know, you can come generate hypotheses about why that might be the case, um, but, but actually I think for this particular intervention there was a sensible surrogate measure to use and my view actually is that the surrogate measure that we chose was very reasonable. Um, you know, and um, I guess the other point I would like to make is that actually in medicine, um, randomised controlled trials aren't always required before interventions get into practice, right? So surgery for congenital heart disease 
didn't need a randomised controlled trial. And bacterial meningitis being treated with antibiotics didn't need a randomised controlled trial. And I guess the disagreement, that, that the primary disagreement that I think um, drives the controversy in this particular space is about whether this intervention falls into that class of treatment or not. Um, and clearly Paul's view is that it does, and my view is that it does not. And, you know, we just, people don't have to agree with each other, and I might turn out to be wrong. I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm, I'm also fine with the, the hypothesis that we didn't give the treatment early enough. You know, that can be explored in a future randomised controlled trial. But, but I do have a problem with the assertion that there are, there are, there's no possibility of harm. Because actually the point estimate from this trial favours harm. Uh, the relative risk of death was 1.18, which is harm. And the only way of uh, drawing causal inferences about therapies is by conducting randomised controlled trials. Uh, and in the absence of high quality data then I, of that type, then, then my view is that the threshold for introducing a new intervention to clinical practice uh, for septic shock right now is higher than before and after evidence and anecdote. Yep. Uh. Thanks, Paul. So um, I'm going to bring Barry in, obviously uh, another expert in vitamin C for... Um, what, what your opinion is now on the basis of this, where do we go with vitamin C research? That's an well, easy question. I, <laughs> I, I agree with Paul. Uh, more randomized trials at varying sizes, I think, are needed. Um, defining the right space for administering the drug, and I, I think vitamin C can now be considered an interventional drug, uh, is important. <clears throat> and defining the concentration of vitamin C uh, that's needed to be able to bring out an outcome. And in future trials, I think it's going to be more focused on just physiological outcomes. I think we need to move to a molecular level to understand. Um, vitamin C in the oncology world has been used now for well over 30 years. And um, in my travels in the sort of vitamin C circuit, um, I spoke recently at the Linus Pauling Institute in Oregon State University and at Kansas City University. And let me tell you, the concentration of vitamin C that is used in patients with cancer um, is 100 grams infused twice a day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for six weeks. So, uh, and you know, and those outcomes have been published and the outcomes on cancers like pancreatic cancer. Uh, but then my other opinion, and we've just finished a trial in bone marrow transplant patients where uh, we dosed bone marrow transplant patients and this was a single center small blinded trial. Uh, in bone marrow transplant patients, we showed that the protocol that I'm going to present in a few minutes resulted in a significantly lower incidence of graft-versus-host disease. It associ was associated with a significant increase in engraftment of the bone marrow or the stem cells that weren't fused. So that stuff will be published. It's been accepted for publication in one of the um, oncology journals. But there's so much where I think we're poking around in different aspects of biology. Uh, I'll mention a few of the leading preclinical studies that we did in just a few minutes. But I think um, more, as Paul mentioned, I think more trials are needed uh, with larger patient populations. Uh, and as we heard yesterday, different countries involved, different kinds of sepsis. In the trial that I'm going to present in a few minutes, the majority of the patients that we had in the trial had a thoracic source, pneumonia, as a cause of sepsis. Um, and that might have influenced our outcome. 
Very, um, thank you very much, Adam. I mean, I think it's a, raises a really fundamental point. So timing's clearly been discussed, but you know how we actually work out the dose of the interventions. Whenever I do a drug trial, I say, well, let's just give the biggest dose I can, but <coughs> that may not be the scientifically appropriate um, w way to go. Um, so I was going to um, hopefully uh, bring in a few other people that we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have um, other uh, people who can contribute. I was going to ask uh, Francois, if, if you don't mind, obviously you're um, uh, leading uh, a vitamin C trial, so um, you know, what's your thoughts on how this work might influence uh, your trial uh, and, and future plans? Um, so I also agree with Paul, and I'll let you pick which one I agree with. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I actually, so I, I, I share, a, 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 I, I think this discussion is fascinating and I, I, sh I am happy I, I listened in. And uh, so we have an ongoing trial which uh, uh, interestingly um, um, tests the uh, same dosing strategy that Dr. Fowler used in Citrus ALI, so only vitamin C with uh, complete freedom to use the other components of the cocktail in both arms. Um, and, uh, and so this trial is ongoing. Obviously, I, I share Paul Young's view and, and Dr. Uh, um, uh, Fowler's view that more trials are needed, otherwise we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, be doing this. Um, and, but I am, you know, sort of appreciative of this information being shared about timing and, and, and fluids as potential effect modifiers. Uh, um, I think, um, yeah, I guess if you want me to keep it really short, that would be the short end of it. Uh, that's fantastic. And hopefully I, I, I do think maybe the one comment I would make is even, even from the perspective of, of Dr. Merrick, uh, and I, like, I'm excited about the prospects of potentially you know, having a huge impact on, on outcomes in sepsis, but if, if the view is, is to make sure every septic patient across the world uh, uh, you know, is, uh, can access this medication, the shortest route uh, to this uh, scenario is much research and good research and you know globally I, I don't think the the the, easy, the the way to get there is is you know to sort of dictate what what treatment should be right now um, thank you very much and hopefully we'll get you back to CCR 22 maybe to present the results I'm just going to offer um, hard um, the, the opportunity to, to comment I, I don't know if you want to you don't have to but uh, if you're uh, interested yeah, just at the back Firstly, I, I, I'm concerned if Paul had had the paper for, for, for two weeks, what the talk would have been like. But, that, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, Paul, I already sent you a note. Um, I would appreciate a research, uh, a letter to the editor. The issues you raise are critical. And if all the ongoing studies are using HAT incorrectly from your view, they will be flawed. And I think rather than debating it each time a new study comes out, uh, uh, we, we would appreciate if you did write uh, a, a letter to the editor raising the issues, then letting, letting the researchers respond. I think you know it's a, it, it is a critical issue because of the number of cases and the number of deaths. And so we had a news story uh, about it actually with you quoted uh, back in July, and I just looked at it as 45,000 views. Uh, the Berry paper, uh, Berry's there, has 75,000 views. So it's certainly something that we've tried to cover in a fair manner. And I, I would just urge you to raise the issue that you raised here in a letter to the editor because it will get an additional amount of attention. And if you're really convinced that people are giving hat incorrectly, echoing that through our pages is critically important. Thank you for that, Hard. That's very helpful. So uh, I'm gonna, somebody's been waiting for a question. I'm going to come before. Um, so there's a question in the front row here. Um, and then we'll go to... Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Amar Gerpes from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, personally, I like uh, all data very much, so thank you very much for providing uh, the, uh, the data. The question, of course, is what you can do with the data and what you could expect with the study uh, as large as it is and des as uh, designed as it is in view of factors that we mentioned. We analyzed 65 studies on septic shock and we looked at heterogeneity uh, and it plays a very important role that will not be addressed in any study. And as you probably know, sepsis is not a diagnosis, neither is septic shock. Huh? It's something that has been invented by some older gentlemen in a hotel room in Las Vegas. 
So uh, it's, it's very difficult to do research uh, studies, randomized control trials on such a vague thing as septic shock. And additionally, the, you have to wonder also what is the attributable effect of any intervention that you do. And so I think that what you have found is exactly what could have been predicted very easily even by my wife who is not a doctor because of all these points that I mentioned and also that we, uh, we published. So I, I, I really wonder, I, I like very much the idea that this study will help us to, make, to, dis, to look at a better design of a study if we want to address this and this will help the trialist. But you have to think of studies that could be as big as 32,000 patients to find um, a, a, an important uh, effect. But, but, not, oh. but not if this drug has not a not massive you, mortality effect. If right? there is a massive, you're yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll stick with questions, because uh, I think that was more of a comment. So I'm going to offer, a, hopefully, a question. Um, and then I'm going to ask some questions. Well, uh, actually, I'll disappoint you. Vladimir Alexi from Ireland. Uh, I'm actually with the main C user. Am I allowed to make a comment, actually? Uh, a I'll try very to brief comment. <laughs> okay, the, uh, Nobody has uh, questions. Uh, the rationale that I started using actually a few years ago when I heard Dr. Marek, uh, no side effects, potentially good benefits. So basically, that's the argumentation. That's what we face when we try to introduce something to the ICU. Why do you buy it? Why do you want it? It's pharmacy. It's nurses, everybody else. Uh, the, the first point and question for, for the investigators, I think your data is valuable, thank you very much. Uh, but again, the comment about the size of the study, I noticed on the table you had adrenaline and milerine on in the intervention group while you didn't have it in the other one. So you need large size, actually. 250 really nice you patients to show effect is very, very small. That's quite clear for everybody okay. by now. So we're going to try and limit the, the, yeah, the, the yeah. comment. And, okay. and, uh, and the, the, so we really need, need big data. Unfortunately. Absolutely. Big trials. Okay. That's what Big Paul trials. would say. So I'm now going to ask two questions and then I'm going to uh, wrap up just we are pushed for, for time. And I'm undoubted that the, the conversation uh, will and can continue. So who thinks we need more trials of vitamin C to answer the question if it changes outcome? Okay, that's good. Next question. Who would treat their nearest and dearest if they were dying uh, of sepsis with the, the, the uh, um, Marek intervention. So, interesting. Uh, more trials, but also some, uh, some uncertainty and, and need for uh, real-world practice. Okay, with that, I'm going to close the session just because uh, Rob will shout at me if I run any more over time. Um, just to say, uh, the lunchtime talk is by uh, Anders Perner, who's going to discuss uh, sepsis ACT, and that's on the... Uh, Andrew's Gallery on floor two. Um, then please don't forget to uh, visit the exhibitors. This meeting uh, wouldn't happen without their contribution, so please do go and uh, acknowledge that. And finally, uh, be back in your seats. Uh